Clint, thank you so much for coming on our Ask an Expert podcast. It's an honor to be on the show. Thanks for having me, Josh. All right. So fantastic. I want to start off first. um, You're big on singularity moments and how impactful they can be. um, And you've got a pretty good one early on in life. So I'd love for you to just share that moment when you're 10 years old and what happened and how it changed your life. Yeah, I was the kid that always had a hard time sitting still. I would just, I would, you know, nervously tap. I would move. I, my right hand would go, my left hand would move. Obviously when you're sitting in a class or, you know, someone's tapping their pen or their clip, you know, moving their foot, you're like, do it one more time. And I swear uh, something <laughs> bad is going to happen. Yep. And all the kids called me the twitcher. I got nicknamed the tapper because I just couldn't sit still. Sure. And it would happen again and again. And the teachers would yell at me. Uh, I got sent to the principal's office. And it was just an issue. And every time I would focus, I would just start to move. It was it was almost how I channeled energy. Mm-hmm. And I had a teacher and his name was Mr. Jensen. And he looked at me as I was tapping in class and he said, young man, he said in the back, he said, Clint, I need to speak to you. We're going to have a conversation. Stay after, stay after. And I'm like, ah, oh, geez. Like, the I'm last getting- thing you want to hear from a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I'm getting kicked out of school as a 10 year old. <laughs> like, this is about to get real. All the other kids are like, Oh, Twitter's going to die. I, I, I'm super nervous. The bell rings and it's just me and Mr. Jensen. And he takes me to the back of the room and he sits me down and he says, listen, he said, I, you're, you're kind of the kid on the list. You know, you're, you're the kid that all the other teachers talk about. You're the problem kid. And you tap in my class and you tap in everybody else's class. I know you get teased. I know you get bullied. He said, but I've watched you though. And he said, it's crazy. You'll just sit there and you'll start to write. You'll do your assignment with your right hand and then you'll tap with your left hand. And then you switch the pen and you'll start writing with your, with your left hand. And then you can tap with your right hand. He's like, I, I think you're ambidextrous. Mm. And I was like, no, I'm Presbyterian. He's like, no. (laughs) He's like, no, that's not what this means. No, no, no. He said, can you tap your head and rub your belly? Right, right. And I'm like, yes. He's like, can you switch it? And can you rub your head and then tap your belly? And literally, without thinking about it, I could do it. And he sat back in his chair and, and he smiled and he said, I don't think you're a problem. I just think you're a drummer. And some people hear that and they're like, what's the difference between those two things? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm someone, Josh, that I believe in moments. I think moments are so incredible. Uh, they're the thing that we remember in life. We don't remember days. We remember moments. Those are unique events, so that, that, that time when we're in the right place at the right moment and something happened and it changed the course of forever. Right. Because in that moment, Mr. Jensen, the old teacher, he leaned back in his desk and he opened up the top drawer and he reached inside and he took out my very first pair of drumsticks. Sure. My very first pair. And he put them in my hands and he said, I want you to keep them in your hands as much as you can. And that was 22 years ago. And I can sit here today and honestly tell you that, you know, 22 years ago, literally to this exact moment, I have tried my best to keep my promise to Mr. Jensen. And for 22 years, I've had the opportunity to tour and record all over the world as a professional drummer. Been on America's Got Talent, uh, played with incredible artists, uh, had an incredible life as a touring musician. And my whole college education was paid for with music scholarships. Right. Because I had drumsticks in my hands. And, you know, I don't say all that to go, wow, good for you, Clint. Or, you know, what was that like? I just, I, I say that because of one person, one person who created a moment that represented possibility and changed my life forever. Well, I love it because I think it's a great example. Um, I'm a big believer in moments can change your life. Um, But I think what happens, unfortunately, is people often, um, they don't see the moment um, or they misinterpret the moment. Um, And what I love about this story is it's a moment when you were 10. And, you know, to your point, it's 22 years later. So obviously you've had a lot of time to reflect and you've had a lot of time to grow on the moment. Um, and, And you alluded to it. And this kind of bleeds into my next question, which is, it did pay for college. So tremendous moment because it gave you this gift and this art um, that people loved and enjoyed and you've toured the country. Um, But at some point 
you started to transition and you started to realize like, hey, I want to start transforming the lives of others, right? You know, AKA be a Mr. Jensen um, yeah. to the masses. Where Talk to me just kind of about that moment and, and how that actually evolved. Yeah. So growing up, I, I never wanted to be a drummer. That wasn't like what I grew up saying, like, I'm going to be a rock star. You know, play Like that was not the, that was not the goal. The goal is to be a pilot. I wanted to, ah. loved aviation. And I graduated high school as a, as a private pilot. I was well yeah. on my way to kind of accomplishing that career. I went and did a two year study abroad. I came home. And at this point in the story, I'm 21. And I went to go and renew my driver's license. And I went to the DMV and I didn't pass the, the vision test. Yeah. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And the lady's like, I couldn't see the letters in the little black box that you test your vision. Yeah, at. right. And long story short, I ended up with being diagnosed with a rare degenerative eye disease known as keratoconus. Okay. And I was told that I would go blind by the age of 31 or 32. And another moment sure. where everything, everything in my life changed. And so the whole course of aviation and that dream was derailed. Okay. And I found myself saying, what do I do with my life? Like, I have no idea. I knew drumming wasn't like the best lifestyle to have a family. There wasn't a sustainable, it wasn't a sustainable thing for me and, and the lifestyle that I wanted to live. And when I was, when I was in high school, I spoke in church and there was a guy that owned a leadership consulting company and he heard me just give this talk in church. And he came up to me after and he said, Clint, I'm doing this leadership conference down in Southern Utah. I want you to come and, and speak at it. I want you to speak to these high school students. I was still in high school and I'm like, no way. <laughs> like, no, thanks. I have no desire to go and speak to other high school kids. They will eat you alive. Right. And he was like, I'll pay you 500 bucks. I'm like, yeah, I might change my mind. I was like, what day do you need me? <laughs> <laughs> like I'm in right for a high school kid. That's like, that's big money. That's a big deal. Yeah. So I went down, I ended up doing this, this, this little leadership retreat. And I put together this workshop called to the beat of the drum. And I just lit my soul on fire. It was, it was crazy to me how I was able to provide value and significance and help you. Like people came up to me and they're like, I'm going to live my life differently because of what you said today. And that was like a very, I don't know, a very profound thing as a high school student high, yeah, right. that, that me, like I had, I just had some sort of a story or impact. And then, and then six other schools came up after that. And they said, we want you to come speak at our school. I came from a little small town. Like we didn't bring speakers in. Like I didn't even know that that was a job. Right. And I went and I did these assemblies and it kept happening and kept, and people would hear about it and they would call me and, and that's how it all kind of, happened. And all of a sudden I found myself starting to, to speak and, uh, and it's turned into what I do professionally for a living to this day. Well, so let's talk about that. Cause obviously starting speaking in high school, um, you were getting paid and actually getting paid well, uh, for, for speaking at such a young age. Um, but from when you actually really are, are doing it professionally, because I know you did have a stint, you did some really cool things with the drumming, you know, not just touring, but you started a group, um, you know, an entertainment cool. Um, and I think that that's fun and we'll, we'll maybe have you back to really delve into that one. But at what point did you realize like, Hey, like this is going to be my career. I want to kind of go to that moment in time where it sounds like you had a little rubber to the road, right? So it's not like you're just cold starting. Um, you had a little rubber to the road, but talk to me about that transition period from going to, Hey, I think I can do this because I've done it, but is this really going to be my career? Yeah. So I had, I actually, so I graduated college and everybody told me in, in college, you know, my parents, uh, teachers, educators, friends, you got to go to college and get the, the degree and you got to find something that's got stability and the salary and the benefits. And you got you to find a career that's going to sustain you. And I'll be honest, in, in college, I kind of chased the, the money yeah. a little bit. Like it was like, okay, I got to get, I got to, I got to make money. I got to, I got to support myself. I got to have this benefit prep package that has a 401k and healthcare and all these things. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I, I chased that and I ended up going into the medical field. Okay. So I, I even left speaking. So I kind of buried my passion. I buried what I loved because I didn't, you know, nobody really told me that was sustainable. No, who, who grows up saying I want to be a motivational speaker, right? Not very many people. And, and when I graduated, I was miserable. 
Josh, I was so miserable. I was working this job nine, nine, nine to five, rinse and repeat, same day, in and out, making really good money. I was an orthopedic specialist. Okay. So I worked in the OR every day, uh, working and consulting with orthopedic surgeons on how to do total knee replacements and hip replacements. And I mean, just, I love to talk, but, but it was just, it was interesting because I, I had a mentor in my life in college and he shared a quote with me and the quote was by Oscar Wilde. Okay. And the quote says, to live is the rarest thing in the world for most people merely exist. Right. And that is all. And that quote haunted me every single day in, in my career because every day I was just existing and I knew it. I was not living. And I don't know if Mark Twain said it. There's a lot of people that, that, that attribute this quote to different people, but he was the one that most people say that he said that there's two important days in a person's life the day you're born, and then the day you figure out why. And that haunted me again. That was an, I, I was like, I, am, I was not born. I was not put on this earth to do what I was doing. Right. And I sat down with two of my buddies, and I said, guys, wouldn't it be crazy? And just out of total desperation, I asked this question. Wouldn't it be wild if you could find a job that allowed you to do three things? And I call them the three Ps. Number one was passion. Okay. Number two was the ability to provide. And three was purpose. Mm. What if you could do something that you loved? Like it yep. pulled on your heartstrings. You were passionate about it. Two, what if you could provide in a way that was sufficient for you? Sure. Doesn't mean you have to make 400000 a year. Doesn't mean you have to make 40000 a year. It's right. just, it's up to you. There is no right answer. Yeah, right. But could it provide in a way that allows you to live the lifestyle you want to live? And then third, purpose to do something bigger than yourself right where you feel like you're living significantly not just successfully there's a big difference between those two things and i posed the question and they both were like i don't think it exists like like look at a teacher full of passion and purpose but every summer they're looking for another job so they can make ends meet right or look at a doctor you know or look at you you're in the medical field you're making tons of money but you're miserable and you're stressed out and malpractice issues and lawsuits and all the dictation and time spent away from family and my buddy just said dude what you're asking what you're looking for is so rare right and that triggered that just instantly triggered that quote by oscar wilde to live is the rarest thing in the world and two weeks after that i quit my job and I jumped into the world of professional speaking full time. So I tell that story just to give a little bit of a background because everyone, you know, they, they, they ask, like, how? How did you do it? How did you make the leap? And there's something special about the beauty of designing a life. Okay. Getting so crazy um, specific about the details like intricate about every little detail, how you're going to map it out. You, you've heard people that they talk about like burn the ships, right? Burn the ships. Like it's about Cortez and he burnt the yeah. ships and all the guys are on the shore and he's like, you're yep. going to either win or you're all going to die. <laughs> like you burn the ships. You, 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 you decease the option of failure uh, by literally eliminating <laughs> any chance any of failure. <laughs> and, and, and when I hear that, I kind of think, well, how, how can I bring the boat closer to the shore? <laughs> right. How can I de-risk the situation? Yeah. And I believe that the power is in the details. Okay. How I did it is I simply, I created what I call, uh, this is really weird, Josh. I don't talk about this a lot. Can, I, can we go on a little tangent for a of minute? Of course we can, yeah. Okay, this is kind of different. Uh, and yeah, I like talking about things I don't always talk about. I designed, uh, hypothetically, uh, an ET. Okay. Okay, so we know E.T., the movie E.T. Yeah. Uh, directed in 1982 by Steven Spielberg. I think that movie is one of the greatest masterpieces of all time. It is, it is, it is hailed as one of the great movies, the great sure. cinematic movies of our time. Most people have seen the movie. As a kid, the movie traumatized me. <laughs> E.T. scared the crud out of me. That's I just, of us. <laughs> yeah, just, but... The reason why is because he was so real. Yeah, right. Like it just like and you 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 look at any like level of puppetry from the, from the Muppets to Yoda in Star Wars to Baby Yoda and, and any kind of like creature puppeteering, ET in my opinion takes the cake. 
And there's a guy, his name was Carlo Rambaldi. Okay. And he was the creator of E.T. This dude went through 300 iterations of E.T. Mm -hmm. The design specs of how to create this masterpiece of a character, I think, translates a lot into entrepreneurship, business, creating a dream, attacking a goal, whether it's weight loss, whether it's a new career, whether it's a better relationship, literally taking the ability to design something that will become iconic, something that will become meaningful, something that is perennial, if you will. Yeah. It's something that consistently happens and and it stays relevant. E.T. when it released, dude, it knocked Star Wars out of the box office. It remained the number one movie in America for 11 years straight. It it grossed $6 billion in just E.T. toys. Like in just in just like, merchandising. like the merchandising. Yeah. $6 billion. And and I believe that the story itself is beautiful. The the, the music, the, the cinematic energy, but it is E.T itself that created this this character this this ideal that when when et was there he was real it was a beautiful piece and i have tried to create my et anybody that asks you how'd you do it i designed the et i I, so so what i what i'm really saying there is every every creature designer when they create a character it goes through the concept that's step number one what's the concept what's the idea what do we want it to look like? What would be the goal, right? What's the outcome? And then they go to illustration design. So they start drawing it out. Like when's the last time we actually take a minute and you draw out your dream? Right. To the to the to the T, like the measurements, the eyes, the the wrinkles, the feel, you know, the marketing, the website. What do you want it to look like? The colors, the spine of the book, the 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 picture of you with 50 pounds less weight. Like, what does that look like? You dry out and then they go to the sculpting and they actually create, it's called a maquette. And it's a small little figure of what it is that they're trying to create. And then it goes to, to uh, molding and they start to mold the, 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 the creature. Then they create all the mechanics, right? Well, how do we make the fingers move? How do we make the eyes blink? How do we make this seem beautiful, but also flawless? It's, it's got to be real. And and then uh, then they do the fabrication. They put this, you know, the skin on the the hair, the I, whatever. Uh, and and then you've got this masterpiece of a creature. You've got this masterpiece of a creation. And it's the same thing. I did the same thing in creating a business, in creating a job, in creating a life that has allowed me to live. I designed the ET. I know that sounds really weird, but. It doesn't. I mean, it's kind of, uh, to use another cinematic reference, uh, it's kind of feel the dreams. If you build it, they yeah. will come, right? Totally. If you pour your heart and your passion into it. And um, and I think passion is, and you talked about it, the three Ps. Passion is a huge part of any success in life. Um, but you you took preparedness, you took planning, and you applied passion to it, um, and, and you stayed with it. It actually reminds me, um, Reed Hoffman um, has got a podcast, Masters of Scale, and he had on one of the founders of Airbnb, and they were struggling at the beginning, right? So I, I forget where they were, but they flew to New York, and they're like, they're going into homes, and they're trying to figure out, like, how can we improve this experience? And yeah. what they started to do was say, okay, let's create the, the top 10 things that we could do. And it starts off, you know, what if we picked them up at the airport? And, oh, yeah, that's that's great. Well, what if it was a limo? Well, what if there was wine inside? And by the end, I think it was like, what if it was a Maharaja on an elephant, right? I mean, it was just so obscenely, you know, incredible and crazy, but it was it was pushing the boundaries that allowed them to really start developing a much better customer experience. And you did the same thing for a life experience. Totally. And, and I think, you know, we sit back sometimes and we just kind of wish or we think about or we dream of what our life could be like. But I think we make that a reality in how we design it. When you get right. so detailed, when you get in and you start, okay, well, if it's something you really want to chase, if it's something you really want to create, put in the time, write it out, draw it out, sure. get, 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 get into the details. The, the, the really, the, the beautiful piece of creating something meaningful is always found within the details. 
Okay. Well, I want to talk about um, this past year. Um, you're obviously a high energy, a very optimistic, a very positive uh, guy. But for this past year, I've had a lot of speakers on the show. Um, it's been a rough year. Um, when when events are canceled, when when flights aren't flying, uh, when doors aren't opening, uh, it makes it very challenging. So I just want to kind of reflect as you look back over the past year, um, what are some of the big lessons learned um, as you faced, you know, which has been a, a difficult year for everybody. So I'm not, you know, devaluing anything anybody's gone through, but from a speaker standpoint, it uh, clearly has been a, a difficult year for you guys. Yeah, it, it has. Uh, March 6th, uh, 2020. 2020 was was uh, on my last live speaking event um and we watched in a matter of two weeks as the whole world fell apart and a business that was designed right a business we yeah. could you know ret that thing that was working very well literally fell apart without you know there was nothing we could do to stop it right and we had this mode this time where all of us as speakers, we kind of said, ah, this will blow over in three months. <laughs> like, ah, you know, it's a little weird right now, but it'll be fine. And then all of a sudden the cancellations came in and the postponements and we had right. 47 events in, in, in a week and a half that canceled or postponed okay. completely. Yeah. That's when it got real. There's a, there's a film called the Shaw's, Shaw's, excuse me, Shawshank Redemption. I can't speak. <laughs> Uh, and in that film, there's a phrase where one of the inmates says, you can get busy living or you can get busy dying. dying. Yeah. And we decided to get busy living. Okay. There is, I, I would recommend this to anybody. If you have Disney plus, you should get on and watch the Disney Imagineering documentary. Okay. It's called the Imagineers and it inspired the crap out of me. I watched that film. I binge watched that whole season and it just fueled me to get innovative, to get busy living, to create something. Right. Um, and I had two events that right on a whim, like within, I think we, it was like a month after we like everything kind of fell. They said, we're converting to virtual and we need you to be a part of this event. And we want you to play the drums. Oh, and we want you to have great cameras and lighting. And, oh, just so you know, it's going out to 3,000 people. Uh, and we'll keep the fee the same, but you've got to make this happen. So I had a little bit of that fire to, to, to provide for those clients. Sure. And uh, so that was the first thing. I found some inspiration and I started to design. And I did the same thing I've done always in my business. I started creating the ET. Yeah. I drew it out. I said, okay, I've got this space. We've got the drums. What do I want this to look like? How am I going to make this happen? What's the technology? Uh, what do I need? Because I like literally, Josh, I had no idea like Ethernet between Wi-Fi. I had no clue what that meant. Like, what's the difference between that? Like <laughs> Zoom? I had never, I think I'd done Zoom maybe a few times. Right, yeah. Like, I had literally no expertise in this world. And so I found what I have always recommended, uh, and it's it's called a board of mentors. Mm. Great mentors were all, are always being mentored, and I found my own board of mentors, people that were living and breathing the life that I want to live, uh, whether that's in speaking or that's in technology. And in this case, I found people who were masters at streaming, okay. masters at camera work and angles and how to do this new virtual world. Right. So I went to the gaming community, gamers. Yeah. Gamers know how to stream. Twitchers. Yeah, dude. And I found uh, a, a brilliant person by the name of Jordan Gibby. And we came together and we collaborated and we made a virtual studio. And we yeah. put it together and it's a gorgeous place. Uh, we've got five cameras. We've got a full drum kit, multiple angles, beautiful lighting. And we've been able to provide an experience and we put together a promo video and we really led the market in innovation in showing everybody what was possible. And it was the life-saving change that allowed us to thrive in this organization um, and in this industry. When we come out of this, we will we will have another product. We will have we we will come out stronger because yeah. of the, the chaos. You'll, you'll be able to live best of both worlds. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. If we want to go travel and fly and go speak live, great. If you, if you don't, or you, that's not your thing, great. I'll stay home and we'll do a virtual presentation. 
Yeah, I, I haven't spoken to a speaker yet who said, you know, I could fly less. So I, I think the ability to do that remote is is awesome. Um, so I want to talk about your book. Um, you wrote a book and I want to dig into this um, and we're going to, but I just want to talk about the concept um, because one of the themes that I've picked up this past year is content and it, the vitality to, to business, um, to promotion, to success, um, to sharing but this content creation is always a bear. And so I want to go back to where you're like, hey, let's put all these ideas in a book from when you're thinking about a blank sheet of paper to where it like, just walk me through what that process was from idea to actual like executing this. Yeah. So I was on a, I was a part of a mastermind group. We were in New York city and we were meeting with other business CEOs and executives and we're talking about how they built uh, dynasties, how they built and ran their organization. And one of the guys that we met with owned a sporting goods store in, in Manhattan. And we're sitting there, we're talking about business and he had this thick New York accent. And I'll never forget. He said, in business, you got to adapt or you're going to die. If you don't adapt, you're going to die. <laughs> it's very profound. I agreed with him. You know, you need to adapt in business. You need to adapt to a market that's always changing. But then I asked him, I said, so what about your management style? Have you felt the need to change how you manage people versus how you managed 20 years ago? Mm. And he fired back and he said, nope, mm -mm. the way I manage today is the same way I managed 20 years ago. And we get results. I was like, all right, another fairly profound statement. And we're in the store. And I look around and all of his employees are my age or younger. Okay. Like, like millennials, Gen yeah. Z high school, right out of college. And I just, I just thought to myself, Josh, I said, I wonder, I wonder if they would say the same thing. Yeah. I wonder if his employees would have the same perception that he does. And so I thanked him for his time. We had 35 minutes to kill until we had to be to the next place. I had nothing else better to do. So I walked up to one of the employees and I just said, Hey, I, I and I'm a customer, right? I'm in normal clothes. I had a backwards hat on. And I just said, I'm just curious, uh, what's it like to work here? And the employee got really quiet, looked around. <laughs> like it felt like we're doing an illegal drug exchange. <laughs> and he said, do you really want to know? And I said, yeah. He said, I can't stand it here, man. Like I literally feel hey, it's just a job. Like we're, we're cogs in a wheel, all of us, just cogs in a wheel, man. He said, I don't even think my manager knows I'm here right now. I'm like, okay, well, then, then why are you still working here? And he said, oh, I've already applied to three other places. As soon as I get an offer, I'm out. Wow. And I thought maybe, maybe the kid just woke up on the, on the wrong side of the bed, right? Maybe he's just having a bad day. So I went and asked another employee. Right. And another, and another, and another. And at the end of 35 minutes, I had interviewed six of his employees, just casually, just walked up. What's it like? What's it like? At the end of those conversations, five out of the six of those employees said they would not be working for him and his store in less than three and a half months. Okay. It was that bad. And it was a moment, another moment that turned the light bulb on for me because I kept thinking, man, I wish the CEO could know. And he has no clue. The perception of leadership versus the reality of the employee experience right. was night and day different. Could not be more different. And that was the moment that started my organization that I've been running for the last five years called the Undercover Millennial Program. It's kind of like Undercover Boss without the makeup. <laughs> and I go in to organizations as a millennial who's looking for a job. And I walk in and I just go, hey, I'm just thinking about applying. What's it like to work here? Right. And they tell me everything, everything. And we have uh, done this for almost five years now, and we have interviewed thousands of employees. And the magic of the research was not when an employee was ticked off about their job. The magic was when I would ask the question, what's it like to work here? And they would respond with, I love it here. I love it here. I love my boss. I love my manager. I love our family, what we get to do. And the reasons behind those responses. And when that would trend in an organization, and to find out what great leaders were doing to create organizations that people never wanted to leave. Right. And I kept having people that we were working with, clients, uh, speaking events. We would go in, we would do the undercover research. We would present our research. 
And people kept asking, do you have a book? Do you have a book? Do you have a book? And I am not, uh, I hate writing. <laughs> I hate sitting down at a computer and just typing for hours on end. It, it was the most grueling process I've ever been through. I would never recommend it to anybody. Uh, I, I don't, I've told Another them, common theme I've heard. Yeah. Like, I will never do it again. I will never do it again. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, you will. Yeah, you will. No, I don't think I will. Um, it was re- it was really tough because I, I wanted to I wanted to write a book that it's Josh, it's not another leadership book written by a you know self-proclaimed leadership expert. There's a lot of those out there. There's a lot of leadership books. This is a book written by 10,000 plus employees who knew when their leaders were getting it right. right. That's what this book is about. And it had you know it's it's almost five years of research thousands and thousands of employees and to take that data and to, to compartmentalize it and to figure out, okay, what are the principles? What are the universal truths and how do I make this repeatable and put it in a book format that flows and makes sense and has some overarching narrative to it. And it ha- I mean, all of the things that good writers are brilliant at and I wanted to write the book myself. It needed to be my words. It needed to be their stories and a lot of authors will do ghost writers or they'll have somebody else write half the book and they come through and like, I didn't want to do that. And we had plenty of developmental editors. Don't get me wrong. We had mm-hmm. plenty of people that, that changed my mess of words into somewhat of a message, but it was a grueling process. But I think in the end result, we've, we've created something that is different. It is unique and it's powerful. And uh, I'm excited to get it out into the world. All right. Well, we're going to dig into it in a minute here, but I want to go into quick fire round. So I've got a few questions here, uh, impulsive answers here. Uh, no right or wrong answer. It's just you. Uh, first one is favorite podcast. Um, the, I would say the ooh, business made simple by Donald okay. Mill. Okay. All right. Perfect. Um, who is your professional inspiration? Uh, Mark Sharonbrock. Okay. Um, favorite book, either current or just all time? Yeah, A Million Miles in a Thousand Years. Okay. Who who authored that? Donald Miller. Okay. Um, early riser or burning the midnight oil? Oh, burning the midnight oil. Always. Okay. I don't understand you people, but you know, hey, it, there's got to be a yin and yang out there. So we'll I'll, I'll represent the, the early morning. Um, favorite pizza? Uh, pepperoni. Okay. All right. Classic. I know. Um, okay. So I want to get back to the book. Um, I love it here. Um, so we've talked about the writing process. Obviously it's arduous, but um, the the content developed, I mean, it just, it synthesizes everything into this just powerful message, um, which I think is incredible. Um, is it out yet or is it coming out soon? It comes out April 13th. Okay. This may be out after, so um, it will be out by now. Where can they find it? Yeah. Amazon, Amazon. Okay. It's on Amazon. Just type in. I love it here. Okay. Perfect. Um, so I want to talk about, um, a theme of stereotyping, um, because I'm going to say guilty. Um, I'm going to charge myself and, and, uh, punish myself here. Um, stereotypes, lazy, self-entitled, um, you know, these are the common themes that we think of, you know, as I look down at younger generations, um, talk to me about kind of the pitfalls of stereotyping. We have to get away from them. We have to. Uh, and I, I blame my industry on some of this because if we can put somebody in a box, right, if we can label them, because everyone's really trying to figure people out, right? You're trying, especially from an employer standpoint, how can I create a connection? How do, how do I keep you here? What are, and so on a marketing standpoint, it's really great for speakers or article writers or podcasters or journalists to come up with these theories that based off of the year you were born, that you should behave a certain way. Right. And we get the stereotypes of millennials like, oh, man, hey, man, if you don't have ping pong tables and, and a lot of bing bag chairs, they're not going to work for you. It's not true. It's not true. Oh, they're all entitled, lazy. This is a generation that just wants it handed to them. It's not true. Right. It is not true. I have interviewed over 10,000 employees. A lot of them were millennials. And did I find ones that were entitled? 
Yes. Did I find ones that were lazy? Absolutely. But did I also find ones that were incredibly loyal, engaged, hardworking? I, I mean, brilliant communicators, tech savvy, kind, good values. Absolutely. How can we, how can we sit back and, and, and categorize <laughs> millions of people right. based off of the year they were born? And say that this is who you are. This is the way you're supposed to be. This is the what, what I read about in Forbes. And so I better start trading you that way. And then these companies, they, they, they wonder that, okay, we did all these things that everybody said that, you know, they did this hundred person survey about millennials and that we're, we're doing all these things that we've changed in our company. And then keep, people are still leaving. Why are they leaving? We have to stop looking at people as a generation and start looking at people as individuals. I'm also not a big fan of personality tests. Uh, I've said that for a long time. The quicker a company can get away from using, you know, Strengths Finder and the Hartman Color Code and the ENPGFIZ test, like get away from those because I know that they can be a tool. All right, I get it. They can be a tool, but they can also be a massive cause of misdiagnosis. Hmm. Like, for example, we worked with a lot of companies that use the Hartman color code and they, they do this. It's all part of onboarding. So yeah. a new company, a new employee comes in, you take the color code. So you're supposed to take this test and answer the questions as if you were a child. Josh, I have no idea what I would have done at five. Like, I don't know. I, have, I, I, can't, I can't honestly, really, truly answer and give you something. that. So, so first off, you take this, this test and you're doing it amongst your peers, then you know you're going to get some result, and everybody's going to talk about it. So you start almost checking off the things that you want people to know about you right. or how you want people to perceive you. And then it spits out this result. And everybody starts looking at people as a color instead of people. I have seen it undercover in organizations where people have gone, oh, you're a red? Mm. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, we, let's not ask Jerry because he's a red dude and reds are just, they're, they're mean. You know, they're the bossy people. Oh, you're a yellow? That just means you're never going to get anything done because you just want to have fun. You know, we look at people as a color, right. not as an individual. And then people were having personal identity crises when it would spit out some result. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is not really who I thought I was, but maybe I am this person, but now I don't know who I am. And I like it, it's, it's just a formula for misdiagnosis. There is no quick hack to understanding people. It takes time. It takes commitment. And a lot of managers and a lot of companies don't want to do that. They're looking for some personality assessment or some generalization to figure out how to connect people. And there just isn't. And great relationships are founded upon time, connection, trust, and things that develop over time, things that take time. And so I think the quicker we can bury the generational stereotypes and focus on individuals and focus on personalizing our connection, what might work for one person is not going to work for the other 50 in the organization. And we've got to be able to realize that. And companies that are, are retaining people longer are creating workplaces where people thrive. They don't just survive because it gets to the part about them, not the part about a generalization. So it sounds like, I mean, and maybe I'm mischaracterizing, so I'm going to just put this out here and, and you can take it, but it sounds like managers need to be more of the Swiss army knife um, because depending on who they're working with is going to require a different tool in order to, to work with them. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, there is no one size fits all approach. Okay. Yeah, every person's different. Like, for example, recognition. Some people might just want money. <laughs> they might just say, give me a gift card to Amazon. I don't, I, don't, I don't want the little, like, cheap water bottle for the Christmas party, like, or some T-shirt that I'm never going to wear. Again, that says the company logo on the front. Like, I'm not going to ever wear that. Right. Like, recognize me in a different way. Some people might lo love that. Some people are like, I, you know, awarded me with an experience so me and my wife can go and watch a play some people everybody's different everybody's different and so you've got to get to know the individual and when you do that you become more relevant 
So I feel, you know, having been in management in a number of different companies, I feel like one of the things that is missing is, um, we'll call it time. And I think a, a part of that is, we'll go to your ET metaphor, which is just, we didn't design the environment to account for this, this aspect. And in conventional terms, that's HR, right? HR yeah. is supposed to facilitate and help provide um, this intangible aspect of a uh, working environment that that is really kind of the, the, the lubrication, the oil of the engine that yeah. keeps things humming along. So what are the recommendations you have for firms to... Um, yeah, I'm busy, right? I mean, I mean, I actually just thought about this. One of my, one of my uh, employees, former employees, um, she just got promoted to VP. Really excited for it, right? It's just you feel like kind of a proud parent. You're really excited, and it's it's a lot for her, right? You know, and I'm like, I remember those days, 60, 70 hour weeks, you know, kind of thing where you're just overburdened. What? How do we decouple from a existing paradigm that we know is fundamentally broken? It functions, but it's broken to something that starts humming and really thriving. Yeah, I think intentionality is important in all of this. You have to be yeah. intentional in, in realizing that employees spell mentorship T-I-M-E. Granted, they can't spell that well, but that's how they spell it. And good leaders, for the most part, they know what they need to do. The great leaders know what they need to stop doing. Mm. And you're right, you're right, Josh. Sometimes we're so busy boiling the ocean like we're trying to do things that are just, it's crazy. The to-do lists are huge. The hustle and bustle of everything that we want to accomplish. We associate success with busyness. Yeah, right. Yeah. And and I have found that there's, you know, there's the people that love to write the to-do lists. But then I saw the leaders that were really good at creating the to-don't lists. Boundaries. They got really intentional about a schedule, specific habits. Like one manager that we worked with, he said every day, every day from 3.30 to 4.30, I walk the floors. I don't email, I don't, I don't text, I don't do anything else. I simply just walk the floor every day and I connect with people. And I also have an open door policy uh, in the mornings from 10 to 11. And if anybody needs anything and they need to talk to me, you can come and he announced it to everybody. Yeah. Just so you know, if there's anything that's on your mind, anything you're wondering, any like you don't have to email me. Don't t- walk, walk. And this was in a tech company. So they're all in kind of the same area, same office yeah. building, same floor. He said, come on over, come on over. Like I've got this time. This is your time. And then he intentionally would walk the floor and go and connect with people that he wanted to connect with. The legacy he was leaving, the, the role he played in people's lives was that of an advocate, not just a boss, because he got to the part about them, because he gave them time. He created a to-don't list. From this time during the day, I am not answering emails. I am not scheduling meetings. I am not doing anything else except giving you time. And it's the same thing that an employer asks of an employee. You're asking for their time. You're asking for their attention. But yet we don't give our time and attention to them. And we wonder why we don't get the same in return. Right. Start creating a to don't list. What are the things that you can stop doing that would allow you more time to create recognition, to create connection? Systemize it in your calendar. Go through and block out some time. That's one thing like we talk about these ideas and it's like, oh, that's a nice idea. But doing it consistently is another, it's a whole nother ball game. Yeah. And I think when you can put it in your agenda, and it's a part, and you know, your secretary knows that, your team knows that. You you announce that to the world. I think it's 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 more actionable that way, and it becomes more memorable that way, just by simply putting it in your phone. Um, even recognition, like a reminder once a week, to take fifteen minutes and recognize somebody. Send a text. Send a thank you. Uh, write a note. Uh, send some flowers. Uh, put to get you know bring Chick Fil A in for everybody. Like. You have to put in a formula into your life, your busy life, that helps you to remember to keep the main thing the main thing. Right. Yeah, I think it's a critical thing. You know, even and it's not just in business; it's in it's in our marriages, it's in our our relationship with our kids. You know, what do you do in the morning? Important. Yeah, what do we do in the morning when we wake up? You know, do you reach over and grab your your phone and you start scanning through all of the emails and you look at Facebook and what happened last night? Or do you turn over to the person next to you and, and tell them how much you love them? 
Right. Now, marriage is grand, but divorce is about a hundred grand. <laughs> <laughs> and, this is you know, true. Having employees, it's a wonderful thing. But when an employee leaves your organization, it costs your company thousands of dollars. Yeah. Um, it's it's a very expensive lesson that unfortunately many companies don't learn from, right? Yeah. Talk about singular moments that you know can have a profound impact in your life. There are lessons happening constantly that people don't have time. So I, I do like your advice of you know the great leaders are the ones that realize what to say no to, yes. so that we can focus on what is important. Um, I want to talk about. Um, this, to me, it's this juxtaposition in my in my mind about the the um, service you were doing that led up to the book, which is, hey, I'm going to go undercover, mm-hmm. and I'm going to start talking to these employees, and I'm going to get this great feedback. Um, you did that because it's one of the best ways to get authentic feedback Um, because surveys and personality, right? There's all these pitfalls. So what can a company do aside from bringing you in, which I'm sure you're willing to do, um, but you've only got so much time. Um, So what what can uh, organizations or managers do to really actually connect to the real person behind the color, behind the badge, behind, you know, the uniform that they have working for them? Yeah. Well, I would first say read the book. Get the book. Read the book. Uh, the book will give you insight and a practical roadmap on how to do this. The second thing I would I would recommend is, is too many times as managers, we stand in front of employees and we say, it's like a fireplace. And we say, give me heat, then I'll give you wood. Like, give me heat. Give me results. Give me productivity. Then we'll talk about recognition. Then we'll talk about time off. We'll talk about your scheduling. Give me results. And I think when we can flip that script And we remember that every employee, every employee is asking you as a boss or as a manager, let me know when it gets to the part about me. Let let me know when you're you're meeting agenda. Let me know when it considers me and my life. And some managers, they hear that and they go, well, those entitled little shining stars in my life, right? Like, let me know if I hear one more entitled comment, I'm going to lose it. And it's not so much about entitlement, Josh, as I think it is about good business, It's about bringing humanity back into the workplace. It's like the bank account of theory. You make deposits of trust consistently every day. I've always told every manager this. The coolest part about your job is that it matters. The hardest part about your job is that it matters every day. Consistently depositing trust, creating moments, becoming an advocate, becoming the mentor, not the manager matters. Two great ways that you can do that. Same thing that Mr. Jensen did in my life. He communicated potential and he communicated worth. Those two concepts are incredibly important. And in our our research, we saw how great managers would do that consistently every day. So potential, another way to think of this is growth opportunities. Are you allowing your people to grow? And are you advocating for that growth? You mentioned the employee that's now the VP. I guarantee she got to that point because you as a manager at some point advocated for her. Sure. You helped her grow. You helped her to catch the vision of the possibilities that could be. If your employees cannot grow where they are at, they will go and grow somewhere else. Right. Full stop. And that's not just like a raise. That's not just a, move, um, a moving up in the company. That's like growing as people. Like we had one organization that the employees were kind of tapped out. It was in, in, in a, like a medical clinic. And so they were hygienists. And it's like, well, you're either going to be an office manager or you're going to like go back to, to school and become a dentist, right? You're right. kind of tapped out there. So how do we communicate growth opportunities in that industry? They started, they started creating it. So they had financial, uh, like they, they partnered with Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. And they provided financial planning and financial growth opportunities for them and their spouses to get out of debt quicker. They they, uh, also provided marriage counseling and parenting classes. Like, how do I grow you as an individual, not just as, as an employee? Companies that grew people, not just staff. Right. Uh, Very powerful thing. So potential. What are you helping me to become? Number two, Recognition, recognition, uh, showing people that they're seen, they're heard, and they're understood. And you're doing that individually. You're recognizing those people personally. 
in our uh, research, we found that there were five ways that employees wanted to be recognized. When employees just said, you know, I love my job and they just care about me. They see me and I'm like, why? What do they do? It was always one of five things. And unfortunately, the first one and the most important was vocal praise. Mm. Vocal praise was the number one thing that employees wanted the most of. It was also the number one thing that was lacking the most. Right. And it's crazy to me, Josh, because that costs zero dollars. Yeah, I know. Zero dollars. Right. And, you know, that that a boy, is that a girl? Good job. The next thing was experiences. Employees loved, like, you know, we went axe throwing as a, as a company. Right. We went and, you know, we, we did a team bowling thing. We went and, and you know, or even I, we performed really well. So my boss got me and my wife tickets to the, ba- the baseball game because he knows that we love the team. You know, just little experiences that people could do outside of work. We live in this world of YOLO, right? And do it for the Insta. And people love to post about experiences. And when you can associate work with a really cool lifestyle, right? that's a big deal. Uh, money was number three. Uh, time off and flexibility was number four. You know, the ability to adapt and say, hey, listen, John, I know you want to go. I know you love to fish. Take, take, take the days off at 4.30 and go fishing. You know, you're doing an amazing job. Go right. fish. Uh, and the other thing was food, like Taco Tuesdays, Chick-fil-A Fridays, bringing food into the office that people loved. Uh, and then the last one was trophies and awards. Mm. Think like a, you know, a letterman's jacket, uh, uh, a plaque, you know, rookie of the year, yeah. whatever it is that really, like, what's the Oscar that you can create? What's the Emmy award that you can create of your business? And, and very carefully and very meaningfully award those to people. That stuff matters. Uh, so recognition and growth opportunities. Those are two brilliant ways to create that connection, that stronger connection where people feel like they're part of something, but they also can become something because of you and your organization. Beautiful. Well, I want to wrap with saying congratulations because you won an Emmy. Um, And I saw the piece. It was a very well done piece. Um, And I just want to give you the recognition for that. Obviously, I had nothing to do with it, but I thought it was really well done. And it was before I even knew you'd won the Emmy on it. And then I saw the Emmy. I'm like, hey, what's this about? So the bottom of the barrel now. (laughs) I'll give an Emmy to anybody. (laughs) No, it, it honestly, it was a really well done piece. Um, uh, again, a theme that has been prevalent this past year has been storytelling. Um, and that, I, it's so funny. So many people recognize the importance of storytelling and so many people appreciate the impact that it can have, but it is a very difficult thing to do well, right? You know, because people are, oh, I can tell a story, but like, does it really have a meaningful impact, you know? And, and that is... That's an art. Um, and so, you know, you guys did a great job and I recognized it just seeing the piece and then instantly the light bulb click. Okay. I can, I see, you know, the connection between this. So it's not the bottom of the barrel. I appreciate your humbleness. Um, but I think that that's a, that's an awesome thing. And it's a testament to everybody watching this, that storytelling should be a vehicle that we should lean on more heavily because it's the best way to connect to who we really are, which is what you're all about. Yeah, I totally agree. We need, we need more good stories to tell. We we need more moments that are captured and that can be used to inspire humanity. It's a cool thing. It is a cool thing. Well, Clint, I want to thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Really appreciate it. I look forward to the book being out um, and I look forward to having you back later this year. I would love that. It's been an honor. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Clint. All right. Fantastic. Um, it wasn't puffery. I saw the piece, right? I, I, again, I try to do my prep. So I'm just trying to, you know, look and see, and I'm like, damn, because again, content for me has been this something that I've always just hated. And it wasn't until I found this vehicle that I'm like, okay, this is my lane. This is my way that I can help create content kind of effortlessly. Now it takes research and prep, which is what I did. And as I'm watching this, I'm like, this is really good. And then I'm like, what did he win the Emmy for, right? Like, it's like 45 minutes later, I'm like, ah, okay. I am literally piecing these together. So that's yeah. awesome. Thanks, dude. I appreciate that. It's, it's, a, it's crazy how it all happened. I mean, I didn't, I mean, the Academy found it and it streamed on, on a television network and it just kind of blew up from there. And I mean, the, the goal is never to, I would have never in a million years thought that I would have won an Emmy. <laughs> Like, I remember when I got nominated, I was like, Whoa. you're like, wait, what? 
you have the right guy? Like, <laughs> really? And then when I won, I mean, it was just, it was, it was crazy. It was a really cool moment. It was really so, cool. I mean, talk about that piece, um, A, spitting image. Like, right. I'm like, is this his kid? Cause like, this is, this is, this is an apple that doesn't feel too far, but like, um, how long did it take to put that together? Yeah. So that we filmed that in, uh, in one day. Uh, okay. Yeah. It was all filmed in one day. And, um, so the little boy, I have a cousin okay. that looks just like me Okay. and it's his little boy. All right. And his name is Tuckett and he looks just like I did as a little kid. And it was perfect. It was a perfect fit. I mean, our, our hairstyle's the same. He's, I know, I know. I was like, damn, like he's got everything yeah, working. Yeah, for him. and he did. He did a great job. He was. That was his first little film that he had ever been in. And oh, I thought he was fantastic for being as young as he was. I thought he just yeah. he killed it. He loved Pokemon cards when we filmed it, and we bribed him with Pokemon cards that, <laughs> that he just loved. And I, we would we show him these cards, and okay, if you get through the scene, we'll give you a Pokemon <laughs> card. And he was like, fine, shoot the movie. <laughs> he would do the seeds. I mean, it was, it was so cute. It was, it was really a fun experience and it's, and it's just touched a lot of lives. It's the videos used a lot. Um, uh, well, so you, I saw on LinkedIn um, and I think actually I need to send you a connect, but um, mutual connection, David Rendell. Um, and so he was a guest on the the show and um, had a just fantastic time with him. But that instantly resonated, you know, kind of his story, which is, you know, different is not bad. It's just different. Different can be success. And I'm like, oh, Mr. Jensen, like this is, yeah, yeah he, he identified that, hey, yeah, you are different and that's okay. Guess yeah. what? You can excel with this difference in this area and like light bulb moment. So 100%. Yeah, and it's it's been fun to share his story. I mean, Mr. Jensen's still alive. I yeah, I saw a picture. So yeah, yeah, big part of my life, and uh, yeah, it's got to be awesome for him. I mean, it, you got to, and clearly he probably doesn't exhibit it as much as you know he feels it. But I mean, you know him, so you can you can read his eyes. That had to have been a pretty awesome um, just fulfillment. Because uh, as we were talking about teachers, right? It's tough for teachers, um, and it, it is purpose and passion. And the providing is is not always there. So you really need to fill up the cups in these other areas. And this had to have filled up his cup. Yeah, we're, we're creating a, a little children's book right now, a picture book yeah. of that awesome. story. And okay. so he's, he's helping out with that. And he's very, yeah, he's very excited. He, I mean, he loved, he loved kids. He taught little kids. He taught fifth graders, uh, third graders his whole career. And so, yeah, he's, he's very excited about the possibility of that becoming a children's book and helping more kids. More kids. So. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, Clint, thank you. Um, I'll let you know. Um, we started this a year ago. Um, we, you are, I think, 105th um, mm. episode interview. So everything paused for us. So we just like started throwing everything at it. Um, we do have a backlog, but we're finally chewing through it. I've picked on somebody full time um, to help with some of our other video production for clients in this. Um, so hope to get to it soon. But when we do, we'll tag you in it. Um, you. Head Headshot wise, do you have a headshot on the website that I can find or do I need to... Have you yeah, seen yeah, yeah. You can, um, you can, I can, I can send you some already on the website, just under event planners. Yep. If you click on that tab and scroll, there's like seven different professional perfect. headshots that you can just download and use whichever okay. one you want. That's perfect. Awesome. Okay. okay. Thank you. I really appreciate Pleasure. it. Tag me, let me know, and we'll, we'll spread the word. And I just appreciate the advocacy. Thank you. Yeah, no, for sure. It's a good yeah. story. So thank you very much, Clint. All right. We'll Bye. talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.